the subject of my talk today is how to write a good paper, or for that matter, a thesis. What is generically referred to as a research report. It'll also cover basically how you write an internal report in a company. Uh, my name is Ray or Uwein Boxman, uh, and I used to teach a full semester course on this subject, basically uh, in the Faculty of Engineering. A one hour lecture is not a substitute for a full semester course. If you have an opportunity to take a full semester course, do it. But those who haven't had that opportunity, I hope that today's lecture will be of some help. I have one request, because there are so many of you, and the time is short, and the material is very much. No questions until the end. If you have a question, write it down. I'll stay as long as they don't kick us out, as long as you want to answer questions, but only at the end. Don't, don't interrupt in the middle. OK, what's the problem? We spend, by we I mean we researchers, me and you, probably spend about 20% of our time preparing research reports. But unlike other tasks that we have to do, like for example, using an oscilloscope, using a scanning electron microscope, where someone takes the trouble to teach us how to do it, by and large, not just you, but all over the world, students don't get any training on how to do it. They're expected to learn it by osmosis. Actually, I would say that maybe 10 or 15 percent of the graduate students, in fact, without a lot of trauma, manage to write reasonable research reports on the basis of having read a few and being aware of what's going on, et cetera, et cetera, don't need a course. Um, there's also about 10 percent that no matter how many courses they have will never get it. And for that matter, they don't make it as researchers either. But there's about 75, 80 percent that's in the middle there that I think such a course is of some benefit, and I hope it will benefit you, even this one hour, mini, mini, mini course. Come on in and sit on the, the desk over, on the tables over here. It's okay. Better than that than standing out in the hallway. Go ahead. Just flip up there on the, on the tables. Now, what's my objective? I want to give you a recipe for cooking a good research report. Now, what I mean by good? First of all, in terms of style and organization, it will be appropriate. The content, of course, is up to you. And that it will be acceptable for major uh, English language, and for that matter, any language in the West, so-called Western scientific community. And most important, that it should be easy to read. Now, this is not a substitute for a full semester writing course. If you have that opportunity, I think you ought to do it. But if you don't have that opportunity or you haven't had that opportunity yet, I hope this will help. Now, when I say give a good recipe, you know, there's uh, more than one way to cook uh, eggplant salad. Okay? Um, I'm going to give you my recipe. Furthermore, it comes with a money-back guarantee. It will always work, but it's not the only way to do it. Okay? You can deviate from the recipe I'm going to give you and still write a good paper. But if it's the first paper you're writing, do it my way and it's going to come out okay. Now, what's going to be in here? Uh, a little bit of an introduction, some things to do before you start writing, a little bit about English composition, and then most of the talk will be on the organization of the research paper, which includes an introduction, a methods section, a results section, a discussion section, conclusions, and it begins with an abstract and a title. We'll, we'll discuss each one of these sections and how they uh, dovetail together. I'm not going to have time to talk about the review process. I will talk about some problems and how to fix them, and then summarize. Now, I began my life as an engineer, as a radio engineer, and a radio station. And I like to make an analogy between what we are doing here and a broadcast channel. 
The objective of a scientific paper is to convey information as efficiently as possible to readers. It's all about the readers. Okay? Without the readers, the paper has no value. It's all about the readers. Keep that in mind, and everything else works out well. Furthermore, we hope that there is one or maybe a few readers, and many, many, excuse me, we hope that there is only one or a few writers and many, many readers. Just like in a broadcast channel, there is one transmitter, and we hope millions of receivers. Now, in order for this system to work, the transmitter and the receiver have to be on the same frequency. They have to use the same protocol. Okay? If the transmitter is transmitting AM double sideband, you're not going to receive it with an FM receiver. Okay? We have to agree on the protocol, we have to agree on the frequency. Furthermore, because it's our broadcast channel, one transmitter, many receivers, we put a lot of effort in making the transmitter work perfectly. The burden is on the transmitter. You spend a million dollars maybe on the transmitter, maybe ten million dollars if there's a satellite relay someplace, and the receivers might be a few bucks. Take that into heart when you write a paper. You hope that there are many readers, and those readers have a big choice about what to read. If they have a bit of problems in reading your paper, guess what? They're not going to bother. So you, as the writer, have to make the effort to make the reader's job easy. Think of the reader as being a $2.50 transistor receiver. Throw away. Okay? And think of yourself as being a $20 million satellite relay station. If you have those perspectives in mind, it'll all work out well. Now, there's no IEEE committee that establishes what the protocol is for how you write a paper. It's been established by convention. What do I mean by convention? This is how people do it. Okay? There is no specification sheet for it. There's no U.S. military standard. But there's a broad consensus about how to do it. And what I'll be basically describing to you is what is the result of that consensus. Now, our objective is to convey information efficiently. We're not writing a murder mystery. There is no virtue in keeping our readers in suspense. Our readers want information, not your personal history, and how you arrived at the results. Time sequence is relevant only to the extent that it affects results. You don't need to photograph the slides, I'll post them. Okay? They'll all be there. Make it easy. The organization, the sequence of presentation, will be optimized to convey information, not to make a good story. We don't hide some facts that we reveal only on the last page. We unfold the information in the order that the reader can best absorb it. Ah, don't do that again. Okay. Now, before you begin to write, and in fact, really, before you begin to do the research, it's a good idea to define what is called the research question. Every good paper and every good thesis is basically centered around a single or at most a few well-defined questions. The objective of your research was basically to answer those questions. Now, what do I mean by a question? A question demands an answer. Where were you born? Israel. Israel. What is your favorite flavor of ice cream? 
strawberry? Okay. I ask questions that demand an answer. Do you like sex? Oh, you don't have to answer. <laughs> okay? They demand an answer. Okay? They, that makes it a question. If I say, um, vacuum mark deposition, there's no question there. Okay? Ask a question that demands an answer. That's the research question. In English, the research question ends with a question mark. If we're speaking it, we raise our voice at the end. That signifies that it's a question. Okay? How old are you? Okay? It's a question. In some fields, particularly biology and medicine, the research question is actually stated formally as part of the paper, but in engineering and in physics, usually not. However, the research question should be implicit in what's called phase four of the introduction that we'll describe in a little bit, basically the statement of purpose. And it must be answered explicitly in the conclusions. It's a question. Some place in the conclusion should be the answer. Applying higher uh, bias voltage improves the adhesion, or whatever. A couple uh, ethical issues. No double publication. Um, the same results may not be published twice. By published, I mean in a journal or a book. Conference proceedings is a gray area. Uh, if they're only available to the participants at the conference, it's not really considered to be a publication. But if they're sold uh, and available freely, eh, not so clear. Some minor uh, overlap between, let's say, parts of a series of publications on a topic which is developing is okay but it should be clear by way of reference what material is old and what material is new. You may not submit the same material to two different journals at the same time, but it is okay to submit a paper that was rejected by one journal to another journal, and you don't even have to tell them that the first journal rejected it. Second ethical point, no plagiarism. What's plagiarism? Passing off someone else's work as your own. And I'm embarrassed to even state this here, but I'm going to do it anyway because I've, I've never ceased to be amazed at what uh, beginning uh, graduate students don't know. Okay? No copy and pasting from the internet. It's an absolute no-no. What you write in your paper is what you write not someone else's words, and not someone else's thoughts. Now, we have to refer to the previous work. That's fine. We do it, but we give them credit. Okay? We have a, uh, a reference and a citation that says, this part here is a result by that person. It has to be clear what is yours and what is somebody else's. If nothing is stated, all the readers will assume it's yours. And that's how it should be. Okay, a few words about English composition. English composition, and for that matter, good composition in any language, has a hierarchical structure, top-down organization. There are chapters or sections, subsections or subchapters, down to the level of a paragraph or a sentence, I guess it could even go lower, a word or a letter for that matter, I suppose. Before you start writing any text, I strongly urge, in fact I demand, that's part of the, part of the recipe, that you write an outline, Rashe Prakim, down to the level of a paragraph. In other words, there should be one line, one word, in your outline for each paragraph. Each paragraph basically develops a topic. So that topic should be mentioned. One word may be enough, maybe two or three words, as a separate line on your outline. Now, you don't chisel the outline in granite. 
You're writing it in a word processor. You can make changes. Okay? But when you make a change, it should be a thoughtful change. Because you realize that, ah, I forgot something, I can do it better, I can organize it a little bit differently, it'll be clearer, etc. Now the reason that I stress this is that one of the major contributors to bad writing is bad organization, misplaced statements. Um, all of a sudden remembering some detail about the method when you're already in the discussion. Already giving a result in the middle of your methodology. Okay? Put things where they belong and it's easier for the reader to absorb. If you have a good outline, a detailed outline, down to the level of paragraph, then everything goes in the right place. You have a thought, you look on the uh, outline, and you know where to put it. If you just try typing stream of thought, okay, it comes out in the balagan that you have in your mind at that moment. And that's okay for your thinking, it's not good for the reader's reading. Okay, now a few words about bottom-up organization. Let us remember that in English, for that matter, Gamba Ivrit, the sentence expresses a complete thought. Now in English, in particular, uh, the sentence, the, the word order is very important. And there's a natural word order that's used most of the time, let's say 75% of the time, and you should use this natural word order unless there's a good reason not to. And the natural word order is everything connected to the subject of the sentence first, then the verb, and then everything else. So here's an example. This relation is the subject. Is is the verb. Valid when x is greater than r is everything else. The chamber is the subject was evacuated is the verb with a diffusion pump is everything else use this word order unless there's a good reason not to use this word order second point use strong verbs I don't want to hear anybody ever making an analysis doing measurements performing experiments unless there's a very, very good reason to do so because it's much better to analyze, to measure, and to experiment. If there's a specific strong verb that you can use, damn it, use it! Okay? Don't inflate your sentence making it longer and harder to understand by taking a good perfectly wonderful verb like measure, making it into a noun like measurement, and then having to use some other verb which is wishy-washy like made. Don't do it. So we don't write, measurements were made of the coating hardness using a nano indenter. Instead we write, the nano hardness was measured using a nano indenter. By the way, the color code in all my slides is Red, stop and don't do it. Green, that's what you want to do. Go. Another point, avoid beginning sentences with long prepositional phrases. Get to the subject right away. Uh, don't write using a CSEM model 3400 nano indenter equipped with a flashlight and a microcomputer. <sighs> the hardness of the coating was measured. Instead, invert the order. The hardness of the coating was measured using a CSEM model, etc., etc. In English, the paragraph is extremely important. Every paragraph is like a mini-composition. In English, it is forbidden to have a paragraph with only one sentence. In Hebrew, people get away with it. In English, it's an absolute no-no. The first sentence implicitly defines the topic of the paragraph. Subsequent sentences develop the subject of the paragraph. 
And then the last sentence presents the conclusion or the main point, oha okets. Any questions up to here? And I said not to interrupt me with questions. Okay, let's go on. Uh, clearly, everyone today is writing papers with a word processor. A couple of quick thoughts about what to do and what not to do. Frequently back up your work. Okay? Stop doing what you're doing and, and you know, press save. At least once an hour, back it up someplace else as well. Uh, put it on your disk on key, okay, or on the cloud. Something not connected with uh, uh, that particular device. Learn on your word processor how to use styles. A style is a collection of commands about how the material looks. For example, to indent the first line of a paragraph, to use a certain font. Define styles for all the various levels of headings and subheadings, and for your main, your, your standard paragraph, and for equations. When you write a paragraph, use the American style of indenting the first line and leaving extra space before the beginning of the paragraph. It makes the paragraph stand out. Um, learn how to use automatic end note numbering. It will save oodles of time when you get to revising, reviving, reviving, maybe reviving, revising your work. <coughs> Don't do that manually. It will, Murphy's Law, your advisor, your reviewer will say, you forgot a reference. And it will not be 44 of 44 references. It'll be number three. OK, and going back and changing everything, pain in the ass. Learn how to do it automatically. Do not insert extra blank spaces or blank lines. OK, between words, you push the space key once. At the end of a paragraph, you push the return key once. If you need to do any other things to adjust the vertical or horizontal positioning, learn how to use the tab control and how to use insert line and page break. And all of this is because word processors today are wonderful in arranging the words perfectly on a page. But if you put in blank lines and spaces, you defeat what they know how to do well. Okay, all of this is a quick introduction. Now to the real part of what we're going to do. Let's talk about the organization of a paper. The paper starts with an abstract which summarizes the work. Note that the abstract summarizes the work. It's not the introduction. We then have an introduction, which basically answers the question, what are we talking about here? There'll be a, sec a section on experimental details, of course, if it's an experimental paper. But no matter what kind of paper it is, there'll be a section that describes what did we do? And then a section, often called results, that basically answers the question, what did we get? It will be followed by a discussion, which basically answers the question, so what? And finally, it will end with conclusions, which maybe contains uh, three or four key points that you want, to to read, you want the reader to remember, and must include the answer to the research question. What I'm going to now do is describe each of these parts and how they fit together. And it's pretty much how I'd be describing, um, I don't know, a radio transmitter. If I was teaching uh, electrical engineers, you know, I would start with maybe a microphone and it would go into an uh, audio frequency amplifier, and uh, then into a modulator, uh, together with maybe uh, an RF oscillator, and uh, uh, maybe to an RF amplifier, and maybe to uh, an antenna tuner, 
and then to an antenna. And I would describe all of these parts and then describe how each one of these is built and how they couple one to the, 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 the next. Basically, that's what I'm going to do about the paper. The paper is nothing more than a communications instrument. Same idea, just instead of um, integrated circuits and capacitors and whatnot, we use words and paragraphs, equations and figures. We can think about this overall introduction, this, uh, excuse me, this overall uh, organization as being two trapezoids connected by a narrow column. The introduction starts with a very broad focus and as it goes along becomes narrower and narrower. The body of the paper, the experimental details and the results, in other words what we did and what we got, very narrowly focused. When we get to the discussion, it starts with this narrow focus, but then expands outward in terms of its breadth when it talks about implications and future work, etc. So let us begin with the introduction. The introduction has four required parts. Every introduction should have these four parts. They're not labeled, but they must be there, and they must be there in exactly this order. The first is general background. The second, which takes up the bulk of the introduction, is a literature review. The third is what's called the gap. And finally, the objective or the statement of purpose. Now, the introduction and the discussion are often the hardest for a novice to write well. Uh, in contrast, the experimental uh, the details and the results are far more straightforward. The objective of the introduction is to give the reader sufficient background information so that he can understand and appreciate your work. We talked about the four required parts. There are also two optional parts called value statements and a preview. So let's go through each of these. First of all, the general background. It places the paper in broad context and it brings the speeder up to read, uh, up to speed. <laughs> brings the speeder up to read. Whatever. Brings the reader up to speed. It should be understandable by every reader. So first of all, you have to figure out who's reading your paper. If you're publishing it in the journal of left-hand screws, there's probably very few readers, and they're all pretty much experienced with left-hand screws. The inter, the, this broad introduction can be relatively narrow. On the other hand, if you're publishing it in something like the Journal of Applied Physics, or worse, science, or nature, then this introduction, this general background part of the introduction, should be quite broad. It should define the topic, and it should be fairly um, short. In a paper, one paragraph. And it's usually very general, non-controversial sentences. You just want to let the reader know what the hell are you talking about. The literature review places the paper in more specific context. It sets the stage for stating what was not done, which comes up in the next part, in the gap, by showing what was already done. Basically, you'll be citing a lot of other people's work in this stage. The question is, how do you order this? And there are three possibilities. You can choose whichever is most suitable for you. One is by approach. We start with the approach which is furthest from the approach you use and end with the approach which is closest to the approach you are using. The second is relevance. relevance. And again, we end with the uh, work which is the most relevant to your work. And the third is chronologically. Starting from the oldest paper that's relevant and ending with the most recent. And you can choose which of these works best for your paper. 
Now, there are several different ways of writing the text when you cite somebody. And this is called citation focus. One is called information prominent. In this, the information itself is the subject of the sentence. Uh, for example, because of the complexity of non-equilibrium behavior, the swarm parameters have been analyzed in non-uniform fields in helium and nitrogen by Monte Carlo simulation and in air and argon by solving the diffusion flux equations. The sentence actually gave information and the subject of the sentence was the swarm parameters. Okay? This is typically used in the beginning of the literature review. In contrast, in an author prominent citation, the author is typically, the author is the subject of the sentence. For example, Boof took into account the additional ionization caused by a beam-like group of fast electrons, etc. This is often used in describing the work which is close to your work. Weak author prominent is where you use a term like many researchers or several authors. And uh, this is typically characterizes the, the state of affairs in the field. As do general statements about the state of the research. So typically in a literature review, you will use several of these forms, each in the appropriate place. Now, one thing you should not do is use a reference number as if it's a word. Reference numbers are not words in English. Okay? Now, how do you know whether you're using it as a word? If you have to pronounce that number, if you have to say it out loud when you read the sentence, in order for the sentence to be a complete sentence, then, no, no, write it a different way. Okay, for example, examples of crack propagation in composite materials are given in 1 to 4. Okay, it would be an incomplete construction of the prepositional phrase, in, if I didn't say 1 to 4. So don't do the red example. Instead, write something like, crack propagation has been previously investigated. Stop. And you just have the numbers there, and they're not part of the sentence grammatically. Now, um, I think it's a good idea to refer to authors by name. And the reason is that if you just have number 22, it doesn't mean anything. Does 22 have, give you some kind of warm feeling? Does it relate to anything in the world? On the other hand, if you write, Boxman showed that. Well, first of all, everyone knows who Boxman is, right? So they can relate to it. Okay? And it helps them remember and, and make sense of it. He doesn't have to stop and go to the back of the paper to make some sense out of the number 22. Boxman immediately makes a connection. He can remember it, and if he happens to know who Boxman is, he can relate to it. So on offer prominent uh, uh, citations, it's a good idea to give the author's name. Now what about citing your own work, and for that matter, the work of your group? You have to treat your own previous work fairly. By that I mean, when you write a literature review, if you have uh, 20 citations, and 19 of them are citations of your work or your group's work, it gives a very definite impression that you don't know the literature. Okay? No one is going to believe that 90% um, uh, of the relevant literature was done by this small group of people. If so, there won't be any readers either. Furthermore, the referees will be very suspicious of such a paper. They will figure these guys don't know anything about what they're doing if all they can cite is two other pieces of work other than their own. Okay, finally, 
uh, we get to the most important sentence of the entire paper in terms of getting that paper accepted, and that's called the gap. The gap sentence basically states what was not done. It could also point out an error in previous work, but be careful and tactful. And that's usually not the case. Or a disagreement or controversy between various sources. Almost all papers that are written are written because there was a gap. Sim something simply was not yet done and you're doing it. Now why is this the most important paper for getting your paper accepted? One of the most common causes for paper rejection is that the referee feels that there's really nothing new here. It's all been done before. Nothing new, can't publish it. If you write a good sentence indicating what wasn't done previously and then showed that your work in fact does this thing that wasn't done before, the referee has to really work hard to reject the paper because he feels that there's nothing new. He's going to have to go to the library and pull out the papers that um, he only vaguely remembers. And you know what? Most of the referees are a little bit lazy and won't do that. Now, how do you write a good gap sentence? Typically, it's really only one sentence long. It must be negative. It has to have a word in there like no, not, never, nobody. It must relate to your previous papers and other papers uh, in your group in the same way. In other words, the fact that there was a gap five years ago when your group started working on a subject is not sufficient to publish this paper. You have to show what is the gap now. And that means in relationship to the other papers that your group has published up to now or that you have published up to now. And it must be explicit, precise, and focused. So for example, going back to the same um, objective that I mentioned before, or research question, the dependence of the interface structure between titanium substrates and aluminum films on the substrate bias voltage has not yet been determined. Okay? Focused, precise, and negative. Now, don't be wishy-washy. Few researchers have investigated is not a gap sentence. That implies, guess what? There were somebody who did investigate it. And if so, those papers are, in fact, the most relevant papers, and they should be the focus of your literature review. Nor should you write, to the best of our knowledge, no one has. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your job to know the literature. To the best of our knowledge, does one thing and one thing only. It wastes six words. Okay? If, despite your disclaimer, someone else had already done it, no one cares that you have written those six words. It doesn't buy you anything. It just wastes space. Okay, finally, the last uh, required part of the introduction is a statement of purpose. It comes right after the gap, and basically you say what the objective of the work is. It's good practice to actually begin the sentence with, the objective of this research was, okay, and then fill it in. The objective of the research always is to fill in the gap and to answer the research question. If you give me one of those three, I can give you the other two. You use what's called the Boxman transformation. You know the Fourier transformation and the Laplace transformation. This is the Boxman transformation. You can make any question into a gap. In other words, state that no one has answered the question yet. And you can make any question into the objective, because the objective is always to answer the question. And you can go from one to any of the others. All you're doing is changing a few words around. Okay, value statements. A value statement is a short one or two sentences that describe why reaching this objective is important. If you have a specific reason why it's important, this is a good place to state it because it motivates the reader. 
And a preview um, can be one of two things. One, you can actually give the most important result right up front, just as a preview. And then the reader is focused on that result and is looking to see what you did in order to get there. You don't have to do it, but sometimes it's a good idea. The other thing for a long work, like a thesis or a very complicated paper, is to indicate the organization. If the organization is very, very straightforward and the paper is short, forget it. But if it's complicated, there's also an experiment and also a theory uh, or, or something non-standard, then this is a good place to tell the reader what's going to happen. That way he can tune in, choose the right protocol, get on the right wavelength, and understand what, where you're going. Okay, next part of the paper. Yes? So, where is the abyssal question? It doesn't appear in the paper. You write it for yourself before you begin. It's not part of the paper in engineering or in physics. Okay? In uh, biology and medicine, sometimes it is. It's called the hypothesis. And the research question then is, is the hypothesis true or false? Okay? But in our field, it doesn't appear. But you should know what the question is before you begin to work, before you even begin to research. Certainly, you should know the Diavad uh, retrospectively when you sit down to write. Okay, next section, experimental details, sometimes called apparatus and procedure, uh, methods and materials, um, whatever. Please do not call it experimental because experimental without anything following it is bad English. Experimental is an adjective and the title must have a noun in it. And this whole section answers the question, what did I do? How much detail do you give? You must absolutely include sufficient detail so that every result present can be duplicated elsewhere by a skilled researcher. Okay, not by a six-year-old, but, you know, another, another researcher in another lab. If you, have secret, if, the, if you have some secrets that are necessary to get the reported results, don't publish it. Okay? The paper should be rejected if you're not saying everything you need it in order to get the result. It's nice to also report details which would help your readers. But you should eliminate extraneous detail. Okay, we usually start with the apparatus. Standard or well-known apparatus, we simply mention, define, and give a reference as appropriate. I used a, an oscilloscope with a, a 100 megahertz bandwidth. Sufficient. But for non-standard, we have to describe it. We describe it by giving its purpose, giving an overall description, generally using a diagram, and describe the parts in some logical order, and then describe how the whole thing works together, how these various parts work together in order to accomplish the purpose of the apparatus. The diagram should be schematic. You only show the parts that are needed in order to explain how it operates. All parts that are mentioned in the text should be labeled in the diagram. And all unusual parts in the diagram should be described in the text. Never use a workshop do uh, drawing. It's too detailed. The lines are too thin. Make a schematic diagram. Likewise, don't use a photograph. Photographs contain too much irrelevant detail, and it's harder to understand than a schematic diagram. This is a good schematic diagram. What's important is that it uses what I call the principle of heads-up display. All the information you need to understand this diagram is basically right here. Each part is labeled right here on the diagram. This is what you don't do. Okay? Assign numbers, 330, I don't know, to some circle. Any, have, does anyone have any idea what 330 is? Neither do I. Okay? The reader has to go looking for the explanation. If he's lucky, it's in the caption. 
If he's not so lucky, it's buried in the text. So don't do this. This is a no-no. This is what you want. Label everything. Your description should be written in the past tense, not the present tense. This is the equipment that you built and that you used sometime in the past. The voice. If it's a human agent, you, the experimenter, did something, I think it's better to use passive. Okay? The voltage was adjusted to 15 volts. It'll be understood that the experimenter did it, not some uh, Maxwellian devil. If it's an instrumental agent, then either the active or passive voice may be used. The generator produced a series of 50-volt uh, uh, pulses, or a series of 50-volt pulses was produced. Either is OK. Uh, how many here are native speakers of Russian? OK. Russian does not have indefinite objects, uh, indefinite articles, or definite articles. This is the biggest problem of Russian writers writing in English, is that you have to get right when to use an and when to use the. This rule works 75% of the time. The first time that a new concept or object is mentioned, it should be introduced using a or an. That makes it known. Thereafter, every time you mention it, it should be preceded by the. When you write a sentence in this section of the paper, where you're describing apparatus, if you can, within the sentence, start with old information and put new information at the tail of the sentence. It makes it easier for the reader to absorb. He's tuned into old information first. Here's an example. Ions were produced with a Kaufman source. Note the A here, Russian speakers in particular. The source, we already know what source, it's the Kaufman source, was positioned 25 centimeters from the substrate surface. The source here is old information. Start the sentence with the old information. The substrate surface is new information. End the sentence with the new information. OK, after we describe the apparatus, we describe our procedure. This is the sequence of events that is followed to conduct the experiment. Again, here, we must give sufficient detail to duplicate the results. Don't give unnecessary detail. It's essential to specify all experimental conditions, parameters, or whatever that's required to duplicate a result, whether it's pressure, voltage, field, flows, whatever. It's a good idea to have a table like this. Whoops, what happened to it? like this, that summarize all of the parameters that you use in your, uh, in your research. Start with everything that's fixed, and then have a line going along the middle, if you will, and then describe all of the variables. For the variables, you list the values that you use or the range that you used. Okay? This should appear towards the end of this section of the paper. Okay, what about non-experimental papers? Theoretical papers. They're organized a little bit differently. There's more choices. I don't have time to go into detail. But um, there's there also a section that answers the same question, what did I do? It'll typically be called things like the model, model assumptions, derivation of equations. All of these basically answer, what did I do? What's important is to state all your assumptions first and then develop your equations. And again here, you must give sufficient detail for duplication elsewhere. For whom to duplicate? Not Mr. Einstein. You have to give sufficient detail for a First year master's student to be able to duplicate your equations. Okay? 
And I mean that he should be able to duplicate your equations with maybe a few minutes thought, not a month and a half of painstaking work to go from equation one to equation two. If I had more time, I would tell you wonderful stories about this. But I don't. Most important for theoretical papers in particular is make sure that all of your symbols are defined and used consistently. Here, too, I suggest making a nomenclature table for your own use as you go and write the paper. And then use it when you proofread the paper to make sure that the voltage is always called V and not sometimes V and not sometimes E. And that V always refers to voltage and never to velocity. These are the things which will drive your readers crazy and will cause the paper to be rejected by your referees. OK, results. This is the heart of the paper. Here's what you, you know, present what you actually got. It answers the basic question, what did I get or what did I observe? Now, typically, we convey most of that information in the form of tables and figures. And the text revolves around these tables and figures. The text is composed of three kinds of sentences. Location sentences, presentation sentences, and comment, comment sentences. The location sentence indicates which figure or table contains a particular result. The presentation sentence actually summarizes what the reader sees directly in the figure or table. And the comment sentences uh, comment on, on, on the result. Now, sometimes L and P sentences are combined in a single sentence, but the comment sentence should never be combined with anything. It must stand separate. Here are some examples. Location sentence. The correlation parameters as a function of distance from the jet outlet is shown in figure three. It says what result is in which figure. It may be seen that the correlation decreases steeply with distance and becomes negligible after five centimeters. Ladies and gentlemen, with that information, the reader should be able to draw the figure pretty much. He's expecting some kind of graph that looks like this, where this is five centimeters. And this is the correlation parameter, whatever that is. OK? That is the test of a good presentation sentence, that the reader could basically draw it based on that description. And then a comment sentence. This result differs significantly from those observed with conventional jets. Questions? The location sentence can be in the present tense, and both active and passive sentences are OK. The presentation sentence, however, should be in the simple past tense. Yes? Sometimes you put the number of the table in, instead of in table four. Uh, yes, you may do that. Absolutely. Here's an example. The wavelength intensity has a Gaussian temporal profile whose width decreases with distances between the sources, parentheses, figure four. That's perfectly acceptable. You have combined, combined the location and the presentation sentence. It's perfectly OK. Um, the uh, presentation sentence where you're really presenting the results should be precise and as quantitative as necessary. Let me just throw at you four sentences and I want to show you and convince you that being precise doesn't cost a lot. The first sentence, it may be seen that y depended on x. This sentence is practically worthless. If y didn't depend on x, you probably wouldn't be presenting the result. It may be seen that y increased with x. Well, this is really conveying information. Same number of words as here, but this contains two orders of magnitude more information. 
it may be seen that y increased linearly with x, even more precise. And all that it cost me was one word. It may be seen that y is approximately 22.3x plus 32. This is the most precise sentence, yet it's the shortest. Now, I wouldn't burden the reader with all those numbers unless they were important. But if they were important, there's no reason not to do it. The point here is we don't rely on the reader to pull all this information out of the figure all by himself. If something is really important in the figure, we not only show it in the figure, but we tell it to him in words. Now, the comment sentences should be intimately related to the specific finding in the preceding presentation sentence. If you have more general comments, save them for the discussion. I'm going to run over time. Does anyone have a problem with that? OK. I had hoped to do this in an hour. It's going to take an hour and a half. You're going to have to suffer with me for a few more minutes. Or you can leave. It's OK. If someone has some place to go, go. But um, I won't be insulted, but I need more time. Um, critical. Don't mix the facts, by that I mean a result, with interpretations and speculations. Results are on the pinnacle of holiness in the religion of science. A result is something that every scientist who follows the recipe that you have given him in the experimental details section will get exactly the same result. It can't be disputed. Anybody can go into their lab with a million dollars or whatever, build the apparatus, and get the same result. That's a very strong test. OK? That's a result. Anything that doesn't meet that qualification does not go in a presentation sentence. It has to be separated. OK? Chalav khan, basar khan. OK? Completely separated. And it goes in a different place called a comment sentence. They never get mixed. It's not kosher. So interpretations and speculations, they have their place, but not in the presentation sentence. A sentence like, the uh, voltage uh, increased linearly with the current because, see the word because? And now I'm going to give a reason why it was linear. That reason is interpretation and speculation on my part. It doesn't belong together with the experimental result that everyone can duplicate. Now, it's critical that all the conditions and parameters, etc., required to obtain a particular result, by that I mean in a specific figure, are given. Okay, that means if you go back to that table of variables, Okay? All the value of those variables must be known to the reader with regards to each and every particular result that you give. So if there were three variables, it means that you have to make three statements someplace every time you present a result. Now, it could be that one of those variables is in fact the axis, the x-axis of your figure. Well, okay. You don't have to mention anything else in particular. But the other two, if there were three, have to be mentioned someplace. It could go into the location sentence. It could go in the figure itself as heads-up display. Or it could be in the caption. But it has to be someplace immediately adjacent to the result. Also, you could have a group of figures uh, where the whole group has some common values of uh, some of the parameters, as long as you st explicitly state that these parameters are true 
for these particular figures. The reader should never have to guess what the conditions are. You have to tell them. And in general, first of all, you give the conditions and then the result. You don't say, uh, we found that uh, the electrons uh, were 25 uh, uh, electron volts in temperature when they were heated by uh, an electron beam. Give the, they re give the electron beam first and then the result. First what you did and then what you got. Now, we all know that figures and tables are very important. It's the key to writing a good scientific paper. So part of writing a good paper is doing good figures and tables. Question number one, when do you use a table? When do you use a figure? Use a table when the absolute value is important. Okay? If it's important to know that the mass of the electron is uh, 9.13724869763243 times 10 to the minus 31 kilogram. If that's very important, put it in a table. On the other hand, if what's most important is the trend, okay, the voltage increases, decreases, whatever, then put it in a figure, a graph, and choose the x-axis so that the most important variable is on the x-axis, not as some kind of parameter. Let me show you what I mean because it's a, a common problem. We get a series of curves like this. Oops, sorry, let me do that again. We have a sinusoidal excitation, and uh, for different temperatures, we get the following results for some period, where this might be T equals 5, C, 10 C, 20 C. Okay? And this is time, this is, I don't know, current. Okay? We're showing I as a function of T. Probably it's not important. At a sinusoidal excitation, what do we expect other than a sinusoidal response if it's a linear system? Okay? Almost no information here. What's really important is maybe the peak value is a function of temperature. That's the graph that should be given, not this graph. Why do people persist in giving this kind of graph? Because it's easy. They have all this information recorded under a oscilloscope. It's all on a spreadsheet from Excel. Okay? They spit it out without thinking about it, but it is not relevant to the reader. What he really wants is peak current as a function of temperature. That's the curve that he wants. This is the important variable. This is STOM. Okay? So give a lot, a lot of thought to what is the point you're trying to get across? What's really important? and design your figures around that. In other words, first of all, think what is the story you're trying to tell, and then choose your figures. Okay, here also use heads-up display where possible. Note here that we labeled each curve heads-up display right there on the, uh, on the, on on the diagram. No one has to look in a legend or in the caption or worse in the text to figure out which curve is which. This is the way you want to do it. 
It's a little bit more work. Excel doesn't do it for you automatically. You actually have to do it. But this is the better way. Um, you want to try to design your figures so that even if someone can't read the language of the paper, they get the gist of the paper just by looking at the figures. Most important is don't be lazy. You've got to do a lot of work to make the reader's job easy. Be sure that you label all axes and that you give the units. Okay? If this is um, bing, 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 let's say this is 20, this is 10, and we're right here, milliseconds. Okay? I, 10, 5, amperes. Don't ever write times a thousand. Approximately 50% of the readers will take that number and divide it by a, a thousand, and the other will multiply by a thousand. It is ambiguous. Use kilovolts, millivolts, or whatever it is appropriate to avoid that. Yes? If it's a ratio, percentage? Uh, then there's no units. You don't have to worry about it. You can use percent if you want. If something is. If something doesn't have units, you don't give it. Okay, the discussion answers the question, so what? The typical elements in the discussion include um, reference to the main purpose or hypothesis, just to remind the reader, a review of the most important findings, limitations and justifications. Was your theory self-consistent? Was the bandpass of the oscilloscope appropriate, etc.? Comparisons between um, elements within the paper or comparing your results to previous results in the literature. And general statements, which include implications and generalizations, recommendations for future work. In general, the discussion starts with specific statements about the present study and then diverges to more general statements and, and wider uh, implications. Now, one of the biggest problems that I see is that uh, authors incorrectly convey the degree of certainty about statements that they make in the discussion, which are not the least bit certain. It's OK to speculate in a discussion. You got a result. No one has ever seen this result before. You know this result better than anybody else. You don't have an explanation that's proven yet, but maybe you have some ideas that could guide the field. Share them with the world. That's okay. But it should be clear to the reader what degree of certainty you're attaching to those ideas. Uh, I propose the scale of certainty, call it Boxman's scale of certainty if you want, that starts at the bottom with a speculation. This is an idea that comes to mind that might explain whatever it is that you did. And we use words like may, possible, or conceivably. The next category I call likely. There's some evidence that supports this idea. And then we use words like suggest or indicates. The next rung up is what I call very likely. There's substantial evidence that supports this idea. And then we use words like is consistent or strongly suggest. And then this is probably the highest scale that you usually obtain, what I call most likely, where there's more evidence or theoretical support for this idea than any existing idea. And then we use words like most likely. Now, when I was in junior high school and they taught us the scientific me method, they told us that your objective is always to prove something. And to prove something, you have to have all explanations on the table. And you have to have some series of facts that shows that one explanation and only one explanation can explain all of, the, all of wh what you've seen. It's rare that we get to that in our field, except for the people who are working in, uh, in this faculty um, quasi-mathematical kind of stuff, like uh, control theory, uh, communications theorems, and things like that. 
Math mathematics you can prove, but mo most everything else, it's rare that you really have a proof. But if you have all possible explanations on the table, and there's a decisive test that indicates that one idea and only one idea uh, provides the explanation, then you can use words like proven, proves, proof, shown, or demonstrated. But if you don't, go back to here. Now, very important, you never introduce new results into the discussion. We don't keep anything hidden and pull it out at the last minute like a magician pulling a rabbit out of his hat. All the results get presented in the results section. Finally, conclusions. This can be the concluding paragraph of the discussion, or better, a separate section called conclusions or conclusions and recommendations. This should be short, in a paper, one or two paragraphs, maybe in a thesis, it could be a page or two. You don't repeat the objectives of the methodology. They are not conclusions. You don't have to repeat it again. They already know what you did. Just remind them what it all means. We don't use indicative sentences like, the micro-hardness and critical load was measured as a function of substrate temperature. That's not a conclusion. And certainly there should be no inf new information in the conclusions, nor in the discussion. Your results are presented in the results. They are discussed in the, dis the discussion. In the conclusions, he's really just giving the bottom line. But no, no, there shouldn't be anything new there. What you're doing is summarizing the most important results and their implications. Think of three things you want the reader, the reader to remember and it must include the answer to the research question. If you do offer recommendations, they should be firmly based on the present work, not something, you know, no rabbits out of the hat. Okay, finally the abstract. It appears first, but it should be possibly written a, as a rough draft before you, be, you start writing the paper. Well, after the paper is written, go back to it and make sure that it's really summarized, it really summarizes what's really in the paper. Sometimes we don't know what we really did until we write it down. So you want to rewrite it when you're all done, and it should summarize in one or two sentences each the background, the objective, the methodology, the most important results, and the conclusions. Now, one of the common problems I see is that an abstract maybe is this long, and half of it is background. The abstract is not the introduction, okay? The paper has an introduction. What background you give should be short, one or two sentences only, and it should be a small fraction of the volume of the abstract. The heart of the, abstra of the abstract is the most important results and the conclusions. The abstract must be informative, not merely indicative. Indicative means something like the voltage of the function of temperature was measured. It merely indicates what work you did. That's insufficient. There must be information as well. For example, it was found that the voltage decreased as a function of temperature, reaching a saturation value of 30 millivolts. Summarize the result. Now, sometimes people will ask me, but I got tons of results. What do I do? Pick the most important one. Ah, they're all equally important. Pick any one. Give some examples. But you must give real results in the abstract, not just, I measured this and I measured that. Give what you actually got, or at least some examples. The abstract should stand alone, no references. Abbreviations. In the body of the paper, if you use abbreviations, and it's a good idea, they must be defined, every abbreviation 
even RF, the first time that you use it, or in a table of abbreviations. In an abstract, you should only use an abbreviation if it's used repeatedly within the abstract and the total space of using the abbreviations and its definition the first time saves space. Otherwise, don't abbreviate anything in the abstract. The title. Again, good idea to compose a title before you begin writing, but go back to it when you're done and see whether the title really expresses the new results that you present in your work. It should be short, two lines at most, and it should accurately express the subject of the new results presented. And no abbreviations in the title, not even RF. Chemical symbols are okay, however. If you use AU for gold, no problem. But that's it. Everything else should be written out. I'm going to skip this. And just one odd fact along the way. How many of the how much how many of the audience native language is Hebrew? Okay, here's the mistake that kills all Hebrew writers. Vo in what's called a compound noun. Several words, each of which is a noun, make up a single noun. For example, velocity distribution. In a compound noun, only the last element may take the plural form. Okay? So, it will always be velocity distribution or velocity distributions, perhaps, but never velocities distribution. It can be electron energy or electron energies, but never electrons energies, even if there are 10 to the 23 electrons involved. Okay? This is the most common mistake of Hebrew writers. I've picked on the Russians, I've picked on uh, Hebrew-speaking uh, natives. Who else do I have to pick on? Anyone else? Okay, I won't pick on anybody else then. So, let me summarize by giving you Eser HaDibrot, the Ten Commandments, for writing a good paper. First and foremost, start by having a well-defined research question. Write it out for yourself. It's not part of the paper, but it should be implicit in the statement of purpose, in the uh, objective that appears in the introduction, and it must be answered explicitly in the conclusions. Organize the paper in the standard manner, introduction, experimental apparatus, method, results, discussion, and conclusions. Prepare an outline before writing the text, and that means an outline going down to the level of one line for each paragraph. And then put each statement into the right place. Have an explicit gap sentence in the introduction. The gap sentence, to remind you, must be focused, must be explicit, and it must be negative. It says what was not done, not was done, or many people didn't do, or whatever. It must have the negative word, no, never, nobody. Give all the details required for duplicating the results. When you present a result, most of your results will be in the form of tables and figures. The accompanying text should contain the following kinds of sentences in this order. Location, presentation, and, if you want, comment. These two are required and they can be combined. Comment is um, optional and it can never be combined with presentation. Present good graphics that are easy to read and understand. Be modest in explanations and implications.
Work on polishing each sentence. Try to make the sentence as short as possible. Eliminate every word that does not contribute to meaning. If you can get rid of the word and the sentence still has the same meaning, you're one up. Make sure that your abstract is informative, that you actually give results and conclusions. And finally, work hard to make the reader's job easy. Okay, I thank you for your attention. And I'll entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Are you going to upload this presentation? Yes, I will. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Panina will send out a notice where it is. Um, now, again, if you, this is not enough. Take the course if you have opportunity. If you don't have an opportunity, read the book. Here's the book. There's flyers on the table over there. And if anyone's interested in buying the book, there's a discount code. Uh, you can save 25%. Okay, get out of here. Have a good night. <laughs>